Hello and welcome to uh, a new edition of Glass Tires Checking In With, which is our kind of still new-ish video series where we check in with mostly artists, but also curators and educators and art world people who we know and love. And in this particular one, we are checking in with one of our auction artists for this year. Now, Glass Tire does a gala every year, which we're not doing because of COVID-19, but we do have all the art in and we're going to sell the art. And this is John Whitfield. He's up in Lubbock. Hello, John. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you, Christina. It's nice to see you too. Well, tell us a little bit about your... Now, you and I have known each other for a while and look at the shirt I'm wearing today. Yay! It's my love it shirt. I've um, actually got a cast shirt on today, the so I'm representing shirt. too. This is nice. It's like Chad Plunkett is in the room without being in the room. He actually is in the room. He's, a, oh, he's in the corner. Great. Back. <laughs> you're, you're not letting him say anything. Um, no. So tell us about yourself a little bit and tell us how you're doing. I want to know how you're doing. Um, it's been an interesting year. Um, I taught high school physics for 11 years up until last May and took the plunge and decided to try to do full-time art and um and it's been amazing honestly um this this kink you know is has been kind of challenging but it's it's pretty normal for me i've always kind of worried about money and where it's going to come from and how i'm going to make it and so now it's just the same thing except i don't have to go to school every day um which is awesome did you have commissions lined up that you're that are being honored that you're doing right now, or what's going on with the that line? So there was a there was a big commission that I worked for months on designing and getting finished um, with the Arts Council of Midland, and so that finished up right here at the New Year. Um, that it was a sizable enough commission for me to be able to feel fairly comfortable going into this venture. Um, but also, you know, it just, it was a the time to experiment with new work, make new public sculpture, put it out there. And since the, the world's gone kind of crazy, um, I've picked up a lot of little weird commissions. Um, you know, I just, I just finished a fireplace, a fire pit for a, a landscaper in town that was like, Hey, I know this dentist, he wants this metal gate. And then this lady wanted a wisteria gate. And then there was this other guy and so it's it's been really kind of interesting you know i've been doing some design and some metal fab um making ends meet while still trying to make my own work so it's it's very positive so you're in the studio a lot are you over at cast doing all this welding most of this metal work i'm doing at cast yeah um you know i, I had a, a couple of book wheels um that i'm making my studio in slayton it's more situated for that um but those um those that work still uh, viable and active um, and so I, I just got a, a new commission for the Wells Fargo building here in Lubbock to make a large sphere I mean a large uh, book wheel. Um, Where do you pour that resin? Those are resin aren't they? Yes yeah they're they're resin coated they're uh, submerged in a two-part resin. Do you do that in Slayton? I do that vault in the basement has a which is amazing everyone come it's a vault party um it has I've, I've worked it out where i can uh you know draw air out of there and so i mean of course i use my protective equipment but then i can just shut the vault door and it vents out and i can i've got a good sustainable temperature down there and it's so that's where i've been doing my resin work for the last few years so were you doing resin work in that room before you put the 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 exhaust thing in there no thank you very much i am a very you know I'm on it in the safety department. Yeah, you are. Yeah. There was a day when I was painting it where I got pretty high without realizing. <laughs> People should know that what you when you talk about your space in Slayton, you were talking about a 1930s, I think, department yep. store. Right? And that he has this building. People, this is kind of amazing. It's this giant space and it's full of his stuff, but it's um it's a live workspace and a studio and everything else. That space has been Renovated a little bit, um, and I think currently Chad and I, uh, Chad Plunkett, the director of CASP, and I, we've shared a studio for years. Um, always like to plug Chad in any social media. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, and CASP. I'm with you. Um, anyway, um, he, uh, yeah, there we go. He gave me this t-shirt. He sent it sure to me. Yeah, this, for this reason. Um, he, he and I have been sharing a studio with Will Cannings uh, for 
over a decade, and um, and it and it's uh, it's time to move on. Um, and so we have this space um, in Slayton where we're going to be basically doing some of the th- same things we did at that other place in this space. It's kind of um, it's just a really crazy large space um, that I've been able to um, kind of yeah renovate into all kinds of different. Areas. And so for people who are listening, so Lubbock, first of all, uh, most Texans will know this. It's up in the panhandle. It's kind of in the middle of the panhandle. Slant is about, I'd say, 20 minutes southeast of there. Is it about 20 minutes? Yeah, it's, it's really just about a 15-minute drive. It's like, yeah, 13, 14 miles from the edge of Lubbock, or from where, from where I'm at in Lubbock. Right, and um, but you live in Lubbock for the most part. And- I mostly do, yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm in Slayton once a week, no matter what. And then of course, if I'm working with certain, if I'm not working with metal in the cast metal shop, then I'm working with other media and other uh, other bodies of work in Slayton. Uh, when we're talking about cast, uh, we're talking about the Charles Adams Studio project, which is, um, which is a campus that shared with uh, Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts. I'm just telling our, our audience. And so this is kind of the arts district of Lubbock. And the first Friday art trail that you guys have is one of the most robust in the state for sure. I mean, thousands of people come out. Of course, right now that hasn't been happening. Right. I did there, and I did a residency at CASP last summer. Um, so I'm very familiar with it, but it seems like, I mean, so first Fridays haven't been happening. It must be very quiet there right now. Yeah, and, and technically CASP is closed down. Um, I've been doing metal work there mostly because it's essential work. Um, but the cast would consider anything that you're getting paid for as an essential job. It's weird, you know, the community um, that we have here in Lubbock is, is really strong. And, and in that district, you know, we've got a lot of people coming in and out. So they're still doing that, but it's just more like a lot of waving, you know, and uh, you know, the metal shop, uh, Noah Wakefield does work in there as well. And he's got some commissions that he's been working on. And so basically, I don't go on Tuesdays and Thursdays because those are the days that Noah is there, oh, um, you know. Oh, and so it's man. just for it's like one in the studio at a time is, is the the protocol. See, and what I know of you, and I've known Juan for like three or four years now at this point. You are are very social, as far as I'm concerned. Is this has this been hard on you? This. Um, shelter in place are y'all doing a whole lot of that up in Lubbock are you sheltering are you seeing I guess I'm asking you have you been able to be social or stay connected being the extrovert that you are well I yeah just less people I mean you know like Chad and I talk probably every day you know he's on the cast campus I'm there every single day um, his kids are riding their bikes around I've been riding my bike back and forth between Sally's studio um, and our and our home here in Lubbock, um, and so it's just it's basically less people, and then they're further apart. But I mean, you know, I've changed a lot in the last couple of years. I've grown up a little, and I'm a little more mature, and so I'm not just out at the bar, you know, like hanging with friends as much anyway, you mm-hmm. know. And so, so, so yeah, th- there's been a change, but I don't think it's affected me too greatly in a, in a negative way. Um, I still get to see the people that I, I really want to see, and we still get to hang out, and so that's good. So you're not particularly stir crazy right now. No, but I'm a little stir crazy all the time anyway. That's why I work constantly. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I'm gonna turn this dryer off. Give me one second. Okay. I think this beer. Um, I enjoyed that little alone time with the camera. Can you leave again later? Yeah, I can. I'll just stop. I'm getting out of yeah, Just give me it. Yeah. Um, can you go downstairs? <laughs> he did it. And here he comes. Oh, that yeah. was it's a, yeah. Yeah, well, there's a, it's a spiral. It's a spiral staircase. It's an Asher. You, yeah. you're, you're in an Escher right now. So actually you are in Sally's studio right now, are you not? Yes, so this is Sally Blair Ceramics Independent Artist Studio here in Lubbock, Texas. Um, it's a fantastic space on the corner of 19th and M. 
Um, we uh, renovated this space and prepared for Sally to become um, a very, very busy ceramicist. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the, then we're now we're in a depression. So we're doing as, as good as we can do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really excellent, uh, an excellent space that we've got to uh, play around in. So um, Lubbock is, um, as people, if people haven't been there, it's big, it's big, it's spread out. I think the city is about, I want to say it's like 250,000 people. Does that sound right? Yeah, with about a 30,000 flux when tax in session. You know, and East Lubbock is, and you're not in East Lubbock, you're kind of downtown basically right now. Yeah. Like Casp and Luca and the downtown area are kind of on the edge of what starts to turn into East Lubbock. And I've got to say, for artists who are like living in cities right now and are thinking about like, what would it be like to get a really cool space in a city that has an art scene? And not take too much for a big, nice industrial space. East Lubbock is has like choice real estate. I have to say, it's amazing. And also, East Lubbock is is definitely by far and away the prettiest part of town. You know, there's not it's very flat here. There's not a lot of water, um, but the the draw runs through East Lubbock, and it's gorgeous. Um, yeah. It doesn't really feel like you're in Lubbock the moment that you get out there. And it's funny because Lubbock moves; they grow you know, to the south, when really that northeast corner is, is the most gorgeous piece of, uh, of land in this area. Um, but yeah, it, it, just look at Lubbock. Look at Lubbock's real estate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can find a 5,000 square foot building for a little over $100,000 to buy. Yeah, um, and that's, and you know, I mean, you can go out of Lubbock if you wanted to get something even cheaper. I'm just saying what's nice about Lubbock itself is that there is an there is an art scene there and it is supportive and it is um, and it is lively and there is the first Friday and things happen and then our, uh, artists come into the residency as well. So it's got uh, people coming and going. And then of course, Texas Tech is a giant state university with a good art faculty and a good art department. Yeah, every year we get new um, interesting students. Um, good friend of mine, Ian Thomas called me the other day. He teaches up in uh, Pennsylvania and he was like, hey, I'm sending down a ceramic student for a graduate level ceramics. She's super cool, you know, um, show her the town, you know, and so there's all, there's a constant influx of people from all over the country. Oh um, gosh, the faculty there is terrific. And I know a lot of them, of course, because I did get to, to be in Lubbock for a few months and I knew some of them anyway, and just through glass tires. So I started to go up to Lubbock and into the Panhandle on regular trips around 2016, 2017. And my stop was, that was kind of the, that really was sort of the hub for me. Like sometimes I would even base my travels out of Lubbock and just spiral out or whatever. But, you know, I'd go from DFW to Abilene and then to Lubbock and then Canyon, of course, uh, where the Panhandle Plains Historic Museum is Amarillo. Yeah. And made friends in these different places. And they're still friends. I've got to say, I've always been super, super fond of the Panhandle. I like it a lot. It feels right. I don't know why. I like the climate. I love dry. I love dry. Um, but it's nice to, it's it's a good yearly trip for me, no matter what. And Brandon Zeck has gone on the trip as well. And I think next year, when things open up again, I'd like to bring Christopher Blay up because he hasn't been up yet. And he wants to go and he wants to meet everybody and see everything. But um, yeah, so I, again, for people who aren't familiar, that's go to a first Friday when things open up again. And then you can go into each of the artist studios. The residency is four artists at a time. And then you've got Luca, which is the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts. And they're doing really nice programming. Um, that's kind of the contemporary of Lubbock. Um, but anyway. Yeah. I just wanted now, to new studios in the back as well. So not only, yeah, in conjunction with our live work studios, uh, cast continues to build um, just work studios for people that they rent at an incredibly inexpensive price. Um, a lot of people actually kind of come together on that too. So you'll get two or three people in the smaller studio and you know, you're going to have three or 400 people come through it once a month to see what you're working on. Um, but there's eight of those currently. And then there's, um, uh, you know, plans for, I think the next set are actually more of a live, more of an apartment. They're going to build four apartments um, that'll, um, and then, and then they'll continue on with more just work studios after that. So um, yeah, it's, you know, the only thing about Lubbock is the only thing about anywhere, I guess it's just geographically isolated. Yeah. You know, we're six, we're six hours 
from anywhere else, you know, Albuquerque, <laughs> Santa Fe, um, you know, Colorado border, which is an important thing to know the distance on um, for some people. The, uh, you know, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, you know, all of, all of Oklahoma City, if you want to go there. For- but you guys have this really interesting connection with New Mexico. That's a thing about the Panhandle that in West Texas that's so different from the rest of Texas. We don't just hang out in New Mexico. We don't vacation yeah. there. You guys are back and forth all the time. All of you. Yeah. Everyone I know in Lubbock is back and forth to New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. No, we my, my kids and I go there every summer to the Jemez Mountain uh, Range. And I teach chess at a little camp down in, in uh, Jemez Springs. And, you know, we spend two, two weeks there every summer. It's it's a gorgeous place. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it is the land of enchantment. I'll have you know. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about the piece that you have given us for this this uh, this fundraising event that we're going to have now online. It's we're moving it online. We have these fantastic artists have given us amazing work. We have Vincent Valdez and Celia Everly. We have Helen Altman. We've got and we've got a piece from you. You gave us a really nice piece. Yeah. <laughs> Would you tell us about the piece? Um, yeah. Um, you know, I've been making these for a while, but I don't know if anyone really knows kind of where it started, um, or very few people do. Um, I was in the studio one day, and it was one of those times where, you know, you just need to go to turn on the lights. Like, you don't really have a, a plan. There's no clue of what really is going on. There's no ultimate piece. And, you just, and I was just kind of there. And I remember, um, like, I saw this big, you know, length of pipe. And, um, and really, I was upset about something else. And so, as the evolved human that I am, I took it out on this pipe with a really large abrasive cutting wheel and just watched the sparks fly. And honestly, it did make me feel better. It's like, you know, Mr. Rogers, like, playing on the keys on the you know, end of the piano hard, you know, and so I, I started cutting this pipe, and since I'm just a little bit anal retentive, like, I made sure they were all exactly the same width, you know, and so I'm cutting these pieces of pipe, and I'm just cutting them at this, like, same width over and over, and uh, and it's just the sound and the sparks, and and then before I know it, I, you know, I had this bucket full of, of these small rings, and every time they, you know, like they'd hit the ground, they'd, they'd make this ringing noise of these, these rings that were ringing. And, and, I, and I was thinking about like, you know, rings that were ringing in circles that like when you spin a quarter on the table, you know, it's going fast enough that it, it doesn't look like a circle. It looks like a sphere and how that's just a time thing. And when you're sitting there and you're just cutting and you're just, you know, and there's no real need for mental or it's all physical. Everything is just physical and, and, and visual. And so, so your mind just starts to go, you know, it's a meditative process for me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I started thinking about that, like how circles can become spheres. And then, and then I spent a few years figuring out how to do that. And so that's what, that's what these pieces are now. They really have become, um, I mean, they're, they're formal investigations that are all a little bit different. Um, and none of them are exactly the same, but they're, a lot of what happens to make that uh, all these little objects, these little like letters that are going to come in to make this paragraph of a sphere, like just that preparation, um, I, I find incredibly meditative and, and kind of glorious. You know, I, I always know that like if there's a moment in the studio where I'm just like, what am I doing here? Like, you know, and because my big deal is you go and you turn on the lights because something's going to happen. And so I go and then I have this bucket of pipe or I see this long section of pipe. I'm like, I'm going to cut some pipe today. And then, and then I, you know, I sand them and then I clean them. And then you have this really nice little ring that's come from this larger thing that contained them all, all this time, but then are being exposed, you know, kind of weathered out of this pipe. And, And when I think about that in relation to the other series that you tend to work on, the, um, the nail head, the nail heads with the letters on them, and uh, and your book wheels. I mean, you work with pattern and repetition, and it seems like it's all sort of therapeutic and meditative for you. Indeed. Yeah. I, well, and I, I read an article not too long ago on Glass Tire about like I have to make, 
you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, at a certain point, like I get weird, -der, weirder than normal. And if I'm not doing something that I feel it even could be productive, like ask, you know, ask Sally why there's a, a jar above the refrigerator full of plastic lids and topo caps and you know she, she doesn't know you can ask her about it she'll be like i don't know why he does that but i mean i can't throw away a gatorade bottle without taking a little orange orange circle off the top and that's fine because yeah. that's what i do she accepts me for that and i don't and at some point there's gonna be a really cool plastic lid probably sphere that will happen because you know i do that so how does it tie into, because I think of you as being a pretty scientific mind as well. And that's what you've got. You were a physics, your physics and et cetera. And I mean, how does, how does the work, all of your work tie into that part of you? Well, I think that the scientific method and what most artists do are almost identical. I mean, you, you have this hypothesis of what you want maybe to make, let's say, and then you, you, you experiment and you test that hypothesis. And then, you know, once you have this object or you have this concept or this performance or whatever it is, then you reevaluate that, go, go back to your previous, you know, drawings or hypothesized ideas and see if it was a successful experiment. If it wasn't, you, you try it again. Um, and so I, I think that the science, if you're scientifically minded, I think you already have like one foot in the door for creativity, because it just, it's a logical process. Um, you know, I don't know, I taught astronomy the last couple of years and uh, at Estacado, and I just did it because I didn't know a whole lot about it, but I was interested in it. And so I got to learn along with the kids, which was great. But there's a really wonderful uh, term called accretion, which is essentially just mass because of gravity coming together. And over time, you know, those masses just like continue to come together and then other little pieces come in and this and the process of basically like the reasons why planets and stars and, and everything out in the universe is spherical is due to this process that's termed accretion, which is essentially just attraction of objects to objects. Right. And I find that like fascinating that and I just I, that whole idea is is there's no one out there right now there's not a scientist on the planet that can tell you exactly what gravity is we just see its effects and so knowing that we're kind of compelled by un unseen forces in order to come together into a spherical shape just i don't know that just makes my heart sing mm -hmm. and, and i've also been you know doing some for lack of a better term just self-lit objects you know um, some of them were commissioned lanterns i would say but, but seeing the shadows come through these objects has been really exciting for me. Um, I did a, a five foot sphere with this crazy like sentinel matrix, like clamp light last few months ago. And I, and I, I loved that. It did not do at all what I wanted it to do as far as like the shadows on the wall and all that cool stuff. But I loved the, I loved that. Um, the idea of light than doing something else. And so, uh, but you know, it, it's always one of those things where right now it's hard to even get that deadline, you know, for some weird installation show. You know, I'd love to do that. I've got all these like weird little pieces now that I've collected and like sending light through them and doing this really interesting kind of ad hoc installation would be great. But there's nowhere to show it right now. So uh, yeah, but that doesn't keep you from getting in the studio and making stuff. You don't, you don't, you're somebody who doesn't seem to need deadlines in order to just go make things like, like the essay that you're talking about that Emily Peacock wrote. She's just like, I'm in my house and I'm just making stuff. I just have to make stuff. And you're that way. Indeed. Writer, Richard's being another one of our auction artists. I'd love for you to just tell us a tiny bit about your, nomadic uh art project that you did with writer and your friend peter yeah. just briefly i i may edit this out but i'd love to have it recorded and yeah. then i wanted you to tell us about your patent pending shows both of those things so Ooh, that's a lot of stuff oh i know so tell us so tell us about the the project that you had with writer richards back in the day right so back in the day um we uh Ryder and, and Pete and I had this 
idea that Lubbock is so geographically isolated that we can take our art to the people. And so how to do that? Um, well, we'd need some type of truck to move that stuff. Why don't we make the truck the gallery? And so we um, came up with the RJP, um, which is the writer John Peters Nomadic Gallery. Um, and we constructed panels, uh, very crude, like basically drywall panels, with essentially clamp lights that lit up a show. And we would drive into a uh, wherever. I mean, we, I think we, gosh, it's hard to say now, but I think it was like at least two dozen shows in the, in the first year. We almost we did it every two or three weeks. We drive to San Angelo or we drive to, uh, you know, we, we did, uh, we were in the Biennial in Austin um, and we actually did two performances that day where we set up at one place and then broke down at another. There we go. But one thing that is, is the patent pending, is that ongoing? So the patent pending, the last show that the patent pending, um, we had a very small exhibition in studio for about three months ago. Well, I, I work with books and basically I'm taking old books that have been discarded and changing them to be formal art objects. And one of the thing, one of the resources of course for old books are libraries that are getting rid of them. I don't know what how yeah, they decommissioning them. their books. Yeah. yeah. So they had the section at Texas Tech Library that was the patent section. Um, and it was, oh, I don't know, 1,200 tomes. Hold on. Yeah, these things are big. Yeah, so this is, this is a patent pending book. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it's, it's a little foreshortened because, I mean, it's as big as my head. <laughs> this is uh, the patents from... March 21, 1961, part four. So on that day, in the 60s, you know, there was a, a numerous amounts of patents that came through the office. They were collected, compiled. They don't do these, they still do the patents, of course, but they don't do the books anymore. It's all online. And I was told that these patents are still available, you know, in a digital format, but basically they were going to rip the covers off and shred the book and just throw them away. And I was like, you know, maybe I'll just take those. And they were like, well, there's a lot of them. And I was like, okay. I took off a day from school and I loaded up the truck three times and drove them out. Wow. I don't even remember where they went, maybe cask. And then they were like, hey, you can't keep these here. And I was like, yeah, I know. I'm going to move them again. And then also now they're in the vault, so it's okay. Yeah, you but you bought an entire department store to deal with your collecting habits. It was a very inexpensive department I, store. I know, I know. But yes, that is true. Um, and so, so I had all these books, and I honestly I didn't feel right um, just doing what I normally do to books to these books. I just it didn't feel right to me. And, but I had so many, and other than like rebuilding the world after the apocalypse, I had no thing else to do with them. And so what I started doing was giving them to artists. And I gave them to a lot of local artists. And I was like, hey, here's your book. What I'm, what I'm expecting from you at some point is a piece of work made from it or inspired by it. I don't care what the media is, enjoy. And then when people would come into town, you know, like we had uh, Jeffy Brewer come in uh, to, you know, put in some sculpture. I was like, Jeffy, here's a book. The Texas Sculpture Group would come in. I'd be like, here's a book. You know, anytime the tech had like a, a big, you know, conference in printmaking or painting or whatever, I'd take a couple of books and have them in my truck and I'd find an artist or two and I'd give them a book with the same, you know, basic idea. So I've given out about 260 something books mm -hmm. um, that have resulted in about 128 individual art works so so anyway yeah so about once a year i get up the gumption and um and find a venue and then have a show and then the other charge was find a show like here's all the images you know if, if you're a member i'll send you the images apply for a show and then and then we get to have lines on the resume or work out there everywhere and you get to meet a larger group of artists that you wouldn't normally have ever interacted with and so that 
that was the patent pending, or that is the patent pending project. Um, so I was going to ask you another question, and we won't, we won't, I won't keep you that much longer. But um, you were a teacher. You were a school teacher for years, high school teacher for years, and um, school's out right now. You've got kids. Yeah. Do you have what is your thoughts or feelings about school being out or when it's going to reconvene or how kids are handling it or what how teachers are handling it? Do you know do you, have you given this much thought? Well, you know, this is the first year since I was 5 that I didn't go to school in the fall. So I really did divorce myself from a lot of it and it was needed. I I needed to not be there. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Like, I don't know how many kids are going to go back to school in the fall, even if the doors are wide open. Mm. I think that there might be some parents that are like, you know what, we did okay. And my kid learned some stuff that like, it wasn't on some test, but like we learned, like if once your kid really knows how to read well and you can foster that and they have their own ambitions to learn something, then there's a lot better ways than being in a classroom to learn that. Um, the apathy of most students is why I had to leave school. Um, I, I I was just trying, man. I really, really wanted them to learn, and they just did not give a shit. So, um, but I mean, also on the exact opposite token, like, I think a lot of parents right now are like, we don't pay school teachers enough. That's like, holy shit. Like, how do you do this every day? You know, I'm really just getting my toes wet, you know? Like, I'm... Christina, like the biggest thing I've done, you know, is like, think about not making a sphere. I mean, and th this has only been like eight months, nine months. Like I need some time, like, you know? Yeah, no, that's great. No, it's good to hear. And I mean, uh, Neil Farso and I are doing another one of our online conversations that ends up getting published, but it's, we're calling it the big reset because so many people that I have talked to, and I, I am talking to a lot of people on the phone and texting and doing this kind of thing. But mm -hmm. a lot of people to me, even if they're very worried about resources and money and whether or not they're going to keep their jobs, one of the things that a recurring um, theme is like, well, yeah, but we don't really want things to go back to the way they were. You know, because the way things were, it wasn't that hot to begin with. Like we, we this whole sense of reprioritizing and figuring out what you value and how you, um, how you arrange and organize your time and your, uh, you know, what you, how you just how you want to spend your time and energy. And it seems like that's getting rethought by a lot of people who were too burned out to think about it before. Definitely. Now they can think about it. And I don't know that things are going to go back to the way they were. And I don't know that that's all that bad. And oh, what you're saying about teaching is exactly like, I mean, I've read so many op-eds from people who are talking about what it means to have their kids at home all the time and they're going crazy. But yeah, valuing the, the work that teachers do, the fact that teachers are essentially, to some degree, just paid babysitters for kids but um, they've always, all, and that's not fair, it's not fair, but teachers have never been paid enough. And uh, maybe, maybe something will come out of this for that reason, I don't know. But we're all doing these kind of interesting reassessments and you, you just caught it at such an interesting moment because you, you were making this big transition and then now this pandemic has come in and it's like, you're doing a reset within a reset. Anyway, I want to just thank you for joining me today. And thank you for the beautiful piece. I'm going to put a picture up of the piece that you made for us. It's awesome. And um, uh, and it's funny because the way you describe the work and the, your reason for making it and kind of the um, the foundation of, of frustration or aggression that went into the invention of the, of the mode of making it. And then you have these colors that are just like... <laughs> Not angry colors, you know. <laughs> it's great. The colors are fantastic, by the way, and they photograph really, really well. But anyway, I have one of these. I have one of your spheres. It's one of my favorite things. I have art. I love my art. I miss my art. I'm at my mom's house right now. But your sphere sits in a place of pride in my home when I'm uh, getting to live with my things. Oh, so I can vouch for your spheres, and I got to pick my colors and. Um, yeah, so, you, did amazing. you basically take the colors that I would do almost every time, honestly, that 
Safety orange and gray, man. Safety orange and gray. It's yeah, great. It's it looks good. great. And anyway, and I know that, and Brandon and I kind of uh, picked the colors for this one. And, you know, we were just super wowed by the new color choices anyway. But anyway, we've well, got that sphere. And I will show pictures of that. Oh, good. And I, and I love the fact that you guys wanted to pick the colors. Like, it's more fun for me in a lot of ways. There's, I mean, yeah, I've got so many com color combinations to try. Um, that it's really nice for when someone wants to. And so, yeah, and thank you so much for having me. This has been such a pleasure. Oh, it's nice to see you. It really is. It's I love these check-ins and um, it's nice to see you. It's nice to guy, kind of get a feel for like, you're in Lubbock. It's like, ah, he's up in Lubbock. All right, well, you have a lovely day in Lubbock and stay safe and stay away from the tornadoes and throw yourself in your vault if a tornado comes your way. I was thinking, I wanted so badly to see a tornado when I was living up there for the summer. I did see a couple of really crazy dust storms and um, those were amazing uh, the weather situation up there is just insane yeah it's so you guys are so exposed it's just like there's nothing to protect you from any weather event and you get them all yeah we miss you i can't wait till this is all not crazy and you can make your panhandle trip come see yeah us. when i can bring christopher blay up this next time too all yeah. right i'm gonna stop the recording